have a presentation from Peter Singer, uh, The Story of the Future, the Trend's Most Challenging Security Leaders. Thank you, Peter. Uh, if I can ask him to go ahead and bring the um, slide deck over here up as well. And um, so uh, I'm someone who is often asked to um, peer into the future for organizations. Again, I'm gonna ask if they could put it on the screen behind me for people to see too, that'd be great. But if not, um, we'll, go, we'll plow ahead. And so I've been asked um, in this role to appear in the future for organizations that range from um, New America to teaching on the topic at Arizona State University. And so at this forum over the years, I've had the pleasure of um, talking about topics that seemed emergent at the time, like cybersecurity, social media, AI, that um, later became important and became almost sort of the norm. Um, secondly, though, I work with an organization called Useful Fiction. And Useful Fiction is a network of creators, thinkers, artists, forecasters, all dedicated to using the power of story to carry across real world lessons. And outside in the hall, you'll see visuals from some of our projects. And so for groups ranging from um, NATO to Special Operations Command, we've been asked to help them identify not only what are the key stories about today and tomorrow that they need to communicate within their organization to their external partners, but also how can they visualize and navigate the scenarios about tomorrow that either trouble them the most or what do they most want their strategy to achieve? And so across these different roles, I've had, um, I think, a particularly valuable vantage point to see what's on the minds of our leaders and strategists about the future. What forces of change leave them most uh, mystified or even fearful? Where do they sense that the world of tomorrow is going to challenge them? And so... What I think, though, is um, interesting and notable about that, across this work at New America, Arizona State, useful fiction, across working with organizations that range from NATO to Special Operations Command, a series of trends in security come up again and again and again and again. And everything from patterns in their strategic documents to when you interview their leaders, to literal word frequency counts when you gather the transcripts and the notes of conferences and workshops, a lot like this. And so you can think of these patterns, these trends, as a little bit like the tectonic plates that are shifting. They're reshaping the geopolitical landscape in ways that we're only beginning to grasp. Sometimes, it happens slowly. Other times, it's like an earthquake. But all the while, they're leaving our leaders' feet unsteady beneath them. And so as this is our 10th anniversary, what I thought I would do is share both these new rules that leaders are wrestling with, but also share them in comparison to what we were talking about and thinking about when we gathered 10 years back. So rule number one, the future is fearsome. Forget confidence. There have been many dark days in the last few decades of national security, but throughout all of them, a sense of confidence pervaded both America's sense of self, but also our approach to the world. There was a core belief that the challenge would be met and we would prevail against our foes. Now that worldview worked through everything from the ambitions of our strategies to the literal verbiage of our doctrines. Often it was to our own detriment. It was also the tenor of the first time that we gathered 10 years ago. Indeed, at that event 10 years ago, we had speakers talking about the successes in Iraq to talking about how war itself was going to be a thing of the past. That confidence has been replaced by a fear of a tomorrow 
where we might lose that next big challenge, and the stakes will be much, much higher. Indeed, the current vibe in U.S. national security circles is perhaps best summed by the Bipartisan Commission on National Defense Strategy, which found that the security environment is both most the, the most dangerous since World War II, but also that a, quote, not prepared U.S. lacks both the capabilities and the capacity to be confident of victory. What you see on the right is an image from a project for one of our partners, the French government, envisioning what a future could look like in a world where we've lost that great power conflict and what are some of the issues that might cause it. Now, to give a shout out to the old band, the Cowboy Junkies, to be scarred but smarter is a good thing. It tells us to worry and prepare, or as the writer Thomas Hardy once put it, quote, fear is the mother of foresight. <coughs> Rule number two, the future is game-changing technology. Forget the apex predators that once dominated the battlefield, geopolitics, and the economy. They're now at risk of becoming prey. At the center of this is a technology that keeps being mentioned again and again, AI. Um, but the way to think about it, I believe, is to paraphrase the founder of Wired Magazine, the recipe right now for pretty much every single defense department activity, every single defense contractor, is to take something that already exists and try to add AI to it. And as you see here, um, that encompasses not just programs, but even roles, everything from maintenance, program management, military medicine, intelligence analysis and collection, to battlefield management systems. The very same thing is happening with robotics on the battlefield, in the grocery stores, on our highways. Now, what's fascinating is um, that was a topic of the very first panel at the very first gathering 10 years ago. But we've taken that idea of a what if, of a maybe one day, into now a certainty. We've gone from asking, will we use robotic technology, to deploying them everywhere from Ukraine to weaving them into every single future battlefield scenario. Like, for example, uh, this image on the right, which is from a project that the British government did envisioning its strategy and what the deployments of their forces would look like. Actually, linking back to the climate change discourse, that is a NATO task force deploying into the high north, and you'll notice that it's muddy, not snowy. Third, however, though, the future is small, accessible, and many. Forget thinking that bigger is better. Stop trying to make Oppenheimer moment happen. We're not in the time of the Manhattan Project, where only a single government on the entire planet was able to mobilize the financial, human, and physical resources needed to create a game-changing technology, which then it alone could wield to be followed several years later by only a few other nations. Every single one of the game-changing technology areas is characterized by far lower barriers to entry, meaning that the math around us has changed. Orders of magnitude are what matter now, be it in generative AI algorithms or swarms of tiny drones. Governments, organizations, and individuals can build, buy, and use pretty much every single area of disruptive technology, which opens up both incredible new possibilities and incredible new threats. Um, as an example, you see the layout here of what Ukraine has been able to do with small drones striking widely and afar across Russia. And on the right, the artwork you have from that prior mentioned British project looking at what if an adversary used that same approach to target a NATO state? What would be the images we might see? Fourth, the future is competition and conflict. We need to forget the old coin of the realm. At our first forum 10 years ago, a key theme was the question of what was then called the quote forever war. 
and then related to that, the idea that, gosh, we dealt with Al-Qaeda and now we were dealing with ISIS. Indeed, there were six different panels that touched on this idea in some way, shape, or form. By comparison, there was one panel on China, and the only person talking about a potential conflict with China was a, um, someone who was much younger at the time, uh, just about to release his first novel. Now, that made perfect sense. For two full decades, the demand side of the equation in security was consumed with battles in the shadows against non-state insurgents and terrorists. And it shaped everything from organizational budgets to organizational identity. Now, every single organization in the national security space, again, in the military, in think tank world, in industry, is wrestling with what does it mean for a world to be shaped instead by great power competition and the fear of conflict? And um, this even includes the specialists in that prior kind of war, a regular warfare that we've heard and talked about earlier. Uh, on the right, you see a project designed to help visualize SOCOM's role in this future era of great power competition and conflict. I want to add, though, that I think this is Peter Singer's personal belief that there is a unresolved and maybe unresolvable tension that's baked into this shift. Just as counterterrorism and counterinsurgency veered back and forth between winning hearts and minds and putting bullets in skulls, organizations have to figure out whether they want to focus on large scale conventional operations or irregular and proxy warfare side of competition that might actually prevent that big direct confrontation. You can try to have a strategy, training, equipping that is both, but it also, like with the coin CT back and forth, risks being a failure at both. Five, the future is new resources and new battles for them. Forget carbon. We have an emergence of a new economy driving the need for new resources beyond the element with just six atomic numbers. Power of all kinds, be it computing power to global influence power, now also depends on silicon microchips and rare earth minerals, which has given their control new strategic importance. And competition over these resources will reshape wealth, geopolitical, alliances, as well as create new sources of power, tension, and conflict. As illustrations on the left, you see a recent article from our New America China Intelligence Project, which is partnered with Blue Path and Defense One. And it's examining key issues in China technology. Um, as you see, all the questions, and Dmitry Alperovich talked about this, uh, essential part of a potential Cold War was not about controlling oil, but microchip production. To um, on the right, you have a visualization from a project with SOCOM depicting how these locales of competition might not just be over the sources and sales of these resources and technologies, but over the new infrastructure running across the world in a new kind of belt and road. Six, for the future's urban, forget clean lines and open fields. Whether it is in the back and forth of competition or scaled conventional wars, the hinge points are not going to be in the open desert, rural villages, even relative burgs like a Fallujah, which had two-story buildings and less than 200,000 people. They're going to seem quaint compared to the coming complex congested operating environment. They're going to be megacities characterized by high rises, deep ur urban canyons, underground complexes, vast sprawl. They're also going to be dense with people, combatants, civilians, intermixed. And the digital detritus from that is going to be overwhelming. So when you're thinking about this future of security and war, as you see here, it's going to be locales that look like this. These are from projects with US Army one on the right helping to visualize um, future combat vehicles. And as part of that also, 
it's not going to be the U.S. as the only one with the heavy weaponry in these environments. We're the one only with the tanks, et cetera. Seventh, touching on something that um, Admiral Grady brought in, the futures of Panopticon. Forget privacy. Jeremy Bentham was a philosopher who lived at the start of the last Industrial Revolution, and he coined the idea of a panopticon, a world in which your every move was observed. He was also a bit of an amateur architect, and so to help with the new Industrial Revolution and its core problem of how do you handle people going from working in their homes to working in these new things called factories, he said, what if we made my panopticon real? And that's what you see on the left there a building in which your every move could be observed. The perfect workplace, he thought. It turned out that people didn't really like it, <laughs> and instead, it became the design of the first modern prison. And that idea of a panopticon has always had that duality of the optimum for management, for government, but also, ooh, this is maybe not utopia, this could also be dystopia. Well, as you heard about from Admiral Grady, when we take all of these trends that we've talked about today, satellites, open source technology, social media, drones, basically we're moving into the digital version of that, transparency on the battle space. And that has profound implications um, for privacy, security, the conduct of war, as both state and non-state actors seek to exploit this for both good and for bad. So what you see on the right is a project for SOCOM looking at, okay, you might be deploying into one of these cities, whether it's on a hostage rescue about what we're about to hear, uh, maybe it's um, a humanitarian disaster relief, maybe it's a conventional conflict. But the key to understand is when you deploy into that city, there's gonna be lots of eyes on you and there's gonna be a whole digital world surrounding you. Eighth, the future is an influence game. Forget truth. In this new era of pervasive data, influence is the new currency. The ability to shape perceptions and thus influence opinion and decisions is often as or even more important than traditional capabilities. This was one of the key conclusions of our book, Like War, on how every act that matters now in politics, whether it's global politics or domestic politics, but also on its side of warfare, comes with an accompanying battle that plays out on the networks, and that battle is often about the truth itself. And so the question is both how do we defend against this with unfortunately many of the problems and mis and disinformation getting worse over the last year due to changes in network ownership and their policies. But we've also have the question of how do we potentially leverage this on those issues of competition that I just spoke about that also for example, Dmitry Alperovich brought into this discourse as well as Admiral Grady. Uh, as an example on the right, you see an image of what a counter to Chinese neocolonialism and debt diplomacy might look like. Ninth, the future is cross-domain. Forget silos. A core concept behind this event and the broader partnership uh, between ASU and New America is that issue areas now blend and cross. Geographic regions and domains connect in new ways. So on the left there, you see literally our mission statement from the website, and you notice how it's not locked in on one single topic or one single area. Now, what that means for all of us is that organizations and even personal expertise that are issue or area specific will only get so far in this new world. Um, this is also reflected in the moves that you have to make. They're going to connect tactical and strategic. They're in many ways gonna be like a multi-dimensional game of chess for the people that um, remember Star Trek. And importantly, there will be back and forth, not just between those domains, but maybe even time itself where, for example, a small move in the cyber domain a year later 
can determine the outcome of a dog fight in the air, like we played with in our Ghost Fleet book. Or for example, on the right, um, that's a visual from a project for uh, US Special Operations, where you might have a battle in the Pacific where the survival of, say, one of those surface warfare uh, vessels that the Admiral commanded will depend on who controls space. But who controls space depends on the successful operation of ground control stations located in places like even Antarctica. So it all connects now. Tenth and final, the future is new model leaders. We, at our, tenth, uh, our, our event 10 years back, um, had many great senior leaders speak, and this has been the case throughout the years, and they've shared wonderful insights. So the question is, who comes next? And how do we develop those kind of leaders for who comes next? Because history tells us the people side of the equation is the needed ingredient to success. And so if you believe that we're facing something new, we need new skills and competencies to navigate this complex landscape. And that has to come from new programs of education, um, training, et cetera. Uh, so as an example, on the right, you see a project uh, for the British. And in envisioning their strategy of the future, we noted how every um, defense academy, every military headquarters, has its hall of heroes where they put up the portraits of their great leaders of the past. So what then will the portraits look like of the winning leaders of the 2040s? And as you can see, we think it is a mix of old, traditional, and new competencies. So in closing, if there's any one lesson to take away from the overall issues and trends that most vex leaders across all these different organizations, it's to let go of the cozy assumptions of a bygone era that too many still cling to. We are in a time of shift in nearly every area, and organizations and individuals who aren't changing to match it are making a choice through their inaction. To stand still in today's environment is to choose to lose the future. Thank you.